Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The next session will begin in two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The next session is about to begin. Hello, bonjour, no hoy. I'm Roger Hilton. A summer is incomplete without the Globsec Bratislava Forum, and it's my pleasure to be reporting from the 17th edition of our flagship conference. We have a roster of all-star speakers and moderators, and I will be bringing you recaps, video highlights, and all of the developments from our international conference. Follow us on social media, and let's get started. As is tradition, we started early with our annual European Defence Roundtable held on the Globesec boat and reviewed the outcomes of the Future Security and Defence Council that was launched last year. Moving to the Danube stage, Globesec President Robert Vash delivered an official welcome and spoke about the importance to continue universal support of Ukraine and the need for unity. Slovakian President Zuzana Chaputova spoke of the need not to cave to bullies or intimidation and expressed hope for the next EU Council to formalize Ukraine's status. Addressing us live from Kiev, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky stressed the strategic importance of the Danube region and the need to continue critical deliveries of humanitarian and military support, as well as the total need for Ukraine to defeat Russian aggression. Staying on the continent, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen reiterated the EU's position to hold Russia accountable for their aggression against Ukraine and pledged to help their country reach their European ambitions. In a one-on-one, -on -one, Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration of Ukraine, Ola Stefanishia, declared Ukraine's intentions to be a competitive member of the EU and bring serious value to the European project. On the subject of the Digital Market Acts, EU Commissioner Margaret Versteger stated the economic potential around the acts and the impending increased data protection for European citizens. On the issue of tech regulation, both Minister Fedorov of Ukraine and Deputy Slovak Prime Minister Remyshova shared the imperatives of regulating tech and creating robust cyber defenses. After a video message from Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dimitro Kuleba, his colleagues Minister Ivan Korchak of Slovakia and Alexander Schallenberg of Austria discussed the impact of conflict on the regional geopolitics. The day ended with a Prime Minister's panel where the leaders of Slovakia, Latvia, and Bulgaria stressed that we all live too long in our comfort zone and that the situation today was a major wake-up call for Europe's eastern flank. That's a wrap for day one. 
For more information about the forum, visit us on our website, stay tuned to our social media, and see you on day two. This is day two of the Globsec Forum 2022. Please welcome to the stage, Ali Aslam. Thank you so much. Thank you and welcome back everyone. As you could just see, we had quite a packed day for those joining us here on day two. Welcome. Of course, we have a large Indian delegation and the Indian foreign minister will be joining us here on stage in just uh, a moment. But indeed, uh, I was just being told backstage that today is the hundredth, uh, hundredth day of the Russian aggression, Russian intervention, if you uh, invasion of, of uh, Ukraine, as a matter of fact. So the fact that we talked about the war in Ukraine throughout uh, day one um, is, is very fitting and of course day two will be no uh, exemption and exception. Uh, the war in Ukraine of course will once again dominate uh, the discussions today without a doubt. But it's easy for, to forget. It's easy to forget that for the past two years all we talked about was a pandemic um, and, and um, I couldn't be more delighted to be joined here this morning by a gentleman who not only was, uh, was the omnipresent uh, figure and face throughout uh, this pandemic, but who steered and guided and led uh, the world population throughout uh, this uh, misery. Delighted to have him here this morning in Bratislava and delighted to, uh, to hear from him. Now he's, of course, the Director General of the WHO. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. Tetros Adanom Gebrecius. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ali. What an honor to be introduced by you. Excellencies, dear colleagues and, and friends, I would like to start by saying Dobre Rano. Good morning to you all. It's an honor to be here, and I thank the government of the Slovak Republic and Mr. Robert Vass and the organizers of the Bratislava Forum for their hospitality. I was honored yesterday to meet with His Excellency Ivan Korchok, Minister of Foreign Affairs and European Affairs, and His Excellency Vladimir Lengvarsky, as well as to visit the National Oncology Institute. After more than two years of virtual meetings, it's very nice to be able to meet in person once more. COVID-19 is a brutal demonstration that a pandemic is as much more than a health crisis. It touches every area of life, economics, education, families, employment, business, technology, trade, travel, tourism, politics, security, and so much more. I think you will agree with me if I say this little virus has taken the whole world hostage for more than two years. When health is at risk, everything is at risk. So the question is, where do we stand? And where are we headed? Many participants of this conference actually asked me this question. Many, many people, the same question. Globally, reported cases and deaths are near their lowest levels since the beginning of the pandemic. However, this trend should be interpreted with caution because many countries have reduced the number of tests they do, which in turn reduces the number of cases they find. And we do see concerning trends in several regions. Reported cases and deaths are increasing in the Americas, while deaths are also increasing in the Western Pacific region and in Africa. 
60% of the world's population is now vaccinated, which is helping health systems to cope and societies and economies to reopen. However, it's still far too early to say the pandemic is over. It's not over. Increasing transmission plus decreasing testing and sequencing plus one billion people still unvaccinated equals a dangerous situation. There remains a real and present danger of a new and more variant variant emerging that evades even the existing vaccines. WHO's primary focus now is supporting countries with the lowest vaccination rates to increase those rates as fast as possible, with a focus on health workers, older people, and other at-risk groups. Through the ACT Accelerator, that's what we are do trying to do, and the co-chair, former Prime Minister of Sweden, Mr. Karl Bildt, is with us, and very honored to have you, sir. How the virus will evolve is very difficult to predict. We know for certain that future variants will have to be more transmissible than existing variants to outcompete them. But we can't predict how severe the viruses will be. This virus has surprised us at every turn. A storm that has torn through communities again and again. And we still can't predict its path or its intensity. We must remain vigilant and on our guard. Whatever scenario comes next, we are in much better shape than we were when the pandemic began, though. So we are in a better shape. Of course, there is progress. We know the virus better. And we have the tools to prevent, detect, and treat it. Those tools can be recalibrated quickly if needed. It's likely that we will be living with COVID for the foreseeable future and dealing with its long-term consequences, including mental health problems and long COVID, which we're only beginning to understand. But living with COVID does not mean just giving up and going, doing nothing. We have to live with it responsibly by managing it through a sustained and integrated system for acute respiratory diseases. But even as we respond to the pandemic, we must learn the lessons it's teaching us, because history teaches us that it will not be the last one. And we look to the future. And as we look to the future, I would like to suggest three key areas in which I believe we need substantial change to make the world, if not pandemic proof, at least more pandemic resilient. First, we need a realization globally, nationally, and locally that health is central to sustainable development. For far too long, health has been compartmentalized and deprioritized nationally and internationally. In too many countries, health has been as a cost to be contained rather than an investment to be nurtured, an investment in social and economic development and sustainability. History teaches us that health is not an outcome of development. It is the means. Both the UK and Japan, for example, began their journeys towards universal health coverage in the aftermath of the Second World War. Not when they were economically strong, but when both countries had been impoverished by war. And in both cases, Universal health coverage has been one of the foundations for decades of stability and prosperity. Importantly, it's not just the size of the investment that matters, it's where the investment is made. Which leads me to my second shift, a greater emphasis 
on public health. In recent years, many high-income countries have invested heavily in advanced medical care, hospitalization and specialization, but have neglected investments in public health. As a result, they were over overwhelmed when the pandemic struck. I mean, the most developed countries were surprised, as you know. For example, contact tracing is one of the most simple but effective public health tools for responding to outbreaks, yet this was a skill largely forgotten in most high-income countries. By contrast, through their experience with previous outbreaks of infectious diseases, many lower-income countries have developed strong infrastructure and muscle memory for contract tracing, which helped them respond well in this pandemic. The Mekong region is the best example. And especially its experience and muscle memory from SARS-CoV-1, the first SARS. The bedrock of public health is strong primary health care, which is the eyes and ears of every health system, helping to detect and respond to outbreaks at their earliest stages at the community level. Primary health care is also essential for promoting health and preventing disease. I do not mean to downplay the importance of secondary and tertiary care, which are vital too, but a strong primary health care system can help to prevent or delay the need for secondary or tertiary care, leading to better health outcomes for people and lower costs for health systems. So our shift and focus should be to keeping people healthy than managing disease, and which is cheaper also in terms of investment, but its impact is higher. The third shift is the need for significant changes in the global health architecture for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. There have been multiple independent reviews of the COVID-19 pandemic, with more than 300 recommendations on how to make the world safer. WHO has synthesized these recommendations into a proposal for a stronger global architecture for health emergency preparedness and response. It makes recommendations for stronger governance that's coherent, inclusive, and accountable. Stronger systems and tools to prevent, detect, and respond rapidly to health emergencies. Stronger financing domestically and internationally. And a stronger and sustainably financed WHO at the center of the global health architecture. Overarching these recommendations is the proposal of a new international instrument to provide the framework for closer cooperation and coordination between countries in the face of global threats. At a special session of the World Health Assembly last year, WHO's 194 member states decided to embark on the process of negotiating such an instrument. If the nations of the world can come together to agree a common approach to the human-made threat of nuclear weapons, then it's common sense for countries to now agree on a common approach with common rules for a common response to threats arising from our relationship with nature. Threats no human can entirely control. The time to act is now. The history of epidemics and pandemics is a history of panic and neglect. The world throws money at a crisis. Then, when it subsides, attention is diverted. Lessons go unlearned. And little is done to prevent the next health emergency. After all, COVID-19 is not the only crisis competing for the attention of politicians and news editors. 
Just three weeks ago, I had the opportunity to visit Ukraine. I visited bombed hospitals and met health workers who continue to serve their communities despite the circumstances. My feeling was so bad because I said it before, maybe it's those who know, I am a war child, so I know war, what war means. I know the smell of war, the sound of war, and the image of war. So my feeling was so, so bad and devastating. I can understand through what condition the kids I met are passing through. Prior to the conflict, WHO was working with Ukraine's Ministry of Health to prepare for the worst case scenario. Although we didn't believe, personally I didn't believe, as you know I used to be foreign minister, that the Russian Federation would invade. When I was asked that question, I was saying, no, no, I don't think so. Although that was what I believed, but in the unlikely, in the highly unlikely event, we decided in WHO to preposition supplies inside Ukraine in different parts of the country. This is before the invasion. Then when the invasion began, we were able to immediately deploy those supplies where they were needed while shipping more from our logistics hub in Dubai. So the prepositioning of supplies helped us to move quickly as soon as the invasion happened, but the prepositioning supplies were not enough, so we moved quickly uh, from our hub in, in Dubai more more uh, supplies. In addition to our prepositioning supplies, we were the first humanitarian organization as WHO to reach Kiev with new supplies from outside, from the Polish border through our warehouse in Lviv, immediately after the invasion. So far, WHO and our partners have delivered more than 500 metric tons of medical supplies to the hardest hit areas in Ukraine, enough for almost 16,000 surgeries to pro and to provide care for 650,000 people plus diesel generators for hospitals and clinics, 20 ambulances and tests and treatments for COVID-19. What is key here is the support we're giving them is based on the need uh, on the ground, and I have already uh, uh, seen it in, in, in person and uh, saw it in, in, in action. And maybe with that, one thing that I would like to share with you is um, I was inspecting the supplies uh, we had in, in, the, in a warehouse in Lviv, and they were showing me supplies. And one of the supplies was um, a crutch for children, crutch, and of course for adults. Uh, then I was holding the crutch for children, and what I was imagining then was children should be children. We, ex we expect them to do silly things and maybe fall from a tree or maybe uh, break their leg while playing soccer. And then, then they need, of course, crash. But to give, to, you know, prepare crash and to um, supply crash uh, to children because of war casualty is, is sad. Um, but just wanted to, to share um, how difficult this war, especially for children and women. Until this year, Ukraine was among the countries making the most rapid progress towards universal health coverage. We're deeply concerned about the impact of the war on these gains. The disruption to health services is bad enough. Attacks on health are unconscionable. Since the Russian Federation's invasion began almost 100 days ago, WHO has verified 269 attacks 
on health in Ukraine, killing 76 people and injuring 59, including health workers and patients. Attacks on health care are a violation of international humanitarian law, as, as we all know. And I continue to call on the Russian Federation to stop the war and give peace a chance, because there can be no health without peace. Of course, the war in Ukraine is the worst problem the world is facing. Maybe you can call it the mother of all problems, because it's bringing more challenges um, and needs our continued attention and focus on Ukraine, because it's the mother of all problems now. At the same time, though, let's not forget the other crisis we have. Yemen, Syria, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Central African Republic. I can give you a long list. And especially Ethiopia, Tigray, where I come from. More than 6 million people have been sealed off from the rest of the world for 18 months. I have families there, I can't call them, never called them because there is no telephone, it's cut by the government. No food, it's just trickling now. No fuel, no banking service, I can't send money to those who are starving. As we speak, that's the longest siege ever that's still running in the world. More than six million population, which is the equivalent of maybe Slovakia, the same population, by the way, in terms of size, under full blockade by both Eritrean and Ethiopian forces for more than 18 months. So let's also give attention to those places while the center of focus being Ukraine. We have to address all the challenges we have wherever, wherever they are. But you can understand that I am in constant pain because this is happening on our, on our watch. Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, a pandemic, war, drought, famine, even more. We face a formidable convergence of overlapping crises fueled by climate change, inequity, and geopolitical rivalry. The only way to meet this convergence is with a convergence of our own, a convergence of nations working together to find shared solutions to shared problems. If there is a will, there is a way. Division and rivalry only breed suspicion, distrust, hate, and enmity. What do you get out of hate? Destruction. An endless war. Solidarity builds respect, trust, and friendship. And as humans, we have the capacity to come back to our senses and to commit to solidarity and to build respect, trust, and friendship. Let's choose that. The only way out of these troubled times is for nations to come together, to collaborate where possible, to compromise where needed, and to seek peace, to use the best in us instead of the worst in us. I thank you, Jacquiem. Thank you so much.
Dr. Tetris, thank you so very much uh, for that resounding speech and also thank, uh, congratulations on a second term. Uh, well deserved. Hopefully this one will be an easier ride than the first. Um, we're going to move on to our next session, which is, um, which is quite a critical one in terms of getting a perspective from the rest of the world. Uh, we're talking about reaching new heights, allies in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, I'd like to welcome on stage uh, Dr. S. Jayashankar, uh, Mr. S. Jayashankar, who is the Indian Minister of External Affairs. My name is Maithri Sitharam, and I've been hosting conversations here at Globesec for a few years, and I'm very excited to meet an Indian counterpart. Um, now, I'd like to remind everyone about a few housekeeping things here. Um, for the audiences who are joining us online, you can uh, ask your questions. I am, uh, I'm very, very interactive in the way I run these sessions. So please ask your questions online using the Globesec app. I have my tablet with me. The session time here is 30 minutes, uh, and that will include all the questions from you. If uh, you do have a question here in the audience, please raise your hand. Uh, do stand up. Give me your name, the organization you represent, and keep your question quite short. We're running very short on time, so I want to ensure that we get in as many of your perspectives and questions as possible. Um, I also want to uh, make sure that our online audience knows to make sure that when you ask your question, please keep it succinct so that I'm not trying to figure out what exactly you're trying to ask, um, and that saves a heck of a lot of time too. Minister Jayashankar, thank you very much. Uh, day two of your trip to uh, the CEE. Um, it's been quite a ride since February for not just the region, not just Europe, not just the West, but it is now, an, it is now trickling in terms of effect uh, of what's happening between Russia and Ukraine into the rest of the world, the East, the global South. Um, paint us a little bit of a picture of India and how India has been impacted. You've come out of COVID. You've had issues on the border with China. You've come out of the Quad with many, many diverse and divergent opinions and an economy that is looking uh, to make dramatic changes, but in very difficult and turbulent times. So if you can paint us a picture of where India is at right now, and then we will pick up the conversation from there. Okay, uh, let me go with exactly that flow. Uh, I think, yes, we are largely out of the COVID, though, the, you know, it never quite goes away. Uh, but we are out of the COVID also with a, with a strong sense of economic recovery. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of optimism uh, about uh, uh, rebuilding and not just leap, uh, rebuilding, but actually leapfrogging uh, in many areas, particularly digital. Uh, I think we handled it uh, very uh, prudently, I almost am tempted to say smartly, uh, in terms of the financial responses, uh, which was uh, uh, we didn't blow the bank uh, in responding. We intervened where we had to, and very effectively. Uh, and the, at the moment, in a sense, the, uh, we've, the, the Modi government has just completed eight years in office. Uh, and what we have done in those eight years is really to, uh, I would say, uh, build almost, a, I, I would say, a social welfare society at a speed and a scale which the world hasn't seen. And in some ways, the COVID has actually hastened that. I mean, uh, we, we, are, uh, we are, for example, you know, as an example, we are giving uh, food support to 800 million people. And we've been doing this for more than two years. So that's like the population of the US and EU put together. Uh, we have a house ownership, house uh, publicly supported house ownership program, uh, which covers about 115 million beneficiaries, uh, which is almost like building houses for Japan. Uh, or even if you look at terms of you know this campaign, uh, this program actually to replace firewood with, uh, with uh, gas cooking. Uh, the, it's, it's impacted 80 million people. That's like changing Germany's kitchen uh, in the space of a few years. Uh, so there's a lot going on there. And why I mention that is uh, many of the global developments today have the, uh, have the potential of actually putting that uh, under stress. Uh, 
your second reference was to China. Yes, we are going through a particularly difficult patch uh, in our relationship with China. Uh, we've had differences in the past, but we've never had a situation uh, where, you know, after 1962, uh, where really agreements on not bringing forces to the border have been disregarded. A very large number of forces have been brought uh, to the border. We've had a clash. Uh, people have died. Uh, and this has not happened now. It happened two years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, so, in a sense, I, I, it's a bit of a diversion, but it's also a useful reminder to Europe that there were other things happening in the rest of the world which sometimes Europe perhaps doesn't pay uh, enough attention to. Uh, and uh, there's also been Afghanistan uh, and, you know, uh, what, what happened there, the circumstances in which uh, the Western, uh, particularly American military forces, left finally. Uh, and now we have Ukraine and, uh, you know, coming into this region, uh, uh, it's, it's a region which I know well. I have lived here uh, in Budapest and in Prague. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's a region which has been very helpful to us uh, when we wanted to get uh, 20,000 students out of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, Poland, uh, Romania, mm -hmm. even Moldova. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's also important for people in the region to realize the, you know, how this is playing out in the rest of the world, that it is creating a huge fuel crisis a food crisis, a fertilizer crisis, yeah. uh, pushing inflation in low-income societies which don't have the margins really to, to absorb that. And so it can very quickly become political uh, in many societies. I think that brings up an interesting question that's come in from uh, an online audience member, um, which is relevant to this, mm -hmm. um, this point that you make about the rest of the world versus uh, right here, right now in Europe or in the West. How interested are the Indian people in the war in Ukraine? Is it a major concern? Is it a minor concern? You've kind of alluded to the fact that it's affecting fuel, it's affecting food, but how interested is the populace itself? I, I think it's a major concern. It's a major concern for two reasons. Look, today our existence is very connected. I mean, everybody sees things on the television, on their phones, uh, on the net, uh, so wherever you are, and because uh, bear in mind today India is a very uh, is is a very digital society. Uh, even people at lower levels of income, the one thing they do have is the uh, connectivity. Uh, so there is a lot of awareness. Uh, I I don't think anybody. Uh, I mean everybody is. Uh, I mean to put it mildly, disturbed. Uh, uh, at the conflict, I mean, they see the pictures, they, they see that uh, happening. But the other part of it is, uh, it has begun to impact people's daily lives, that, you know, as a, it's, it's impacting the uh, petrol cost uh, at the bank, it is impacting your uh, wheat cost uh, in your uh, shopping. Uh, it will have, you know, impact for farmers uh, to get along with sowing. Uh, uh, and, and I think businesses of, uh, you know, when it impacts business, because mm -hmm. it is impacting business in multiple ways. I mean, yeah. you know, there's a container problem, there's an insurance problem. Uh, you don't get certain commodities or if you do, the prices are up. So it's disrupting uh, uh, life. And it's, again, it's not a unique causal disruption. I mean, at the same time, I, I think some of the lockdowns in China are also having an economic uh, impact. So, but when you disrupt the economy, it shows up in employment. Uh, so I think it does trouble people. I mean, um, trouble people is a very, uh, very... Uh, well, it's, it's a job of a government. I, I understand yeah. it would trouble people. I think it troubles people in the West as well when sure. cost of living crisis starts hitting. Um, at some point, when you look at global supply chains, this is a very different world in 2022 that we operate in. Uh, versus, say, in 1991, pre-liberalization, when India could afford to stand by non-alignment as it was defined then. I think a lot of critics would ask you um, the increase in your oil imports uh, that have happened between 2000, 
2021 and 2022. It's nine times higher as of this month. Um, you have been questioned in terms of that increased oil import from Russia, $95 a barrel for, for Russian oil, 119 approximately for Brent crude. Um, is that profiteering? Is that looking out for your own interest? What does that really mean for foreign policy in India? And how do you tie non-alignment with nine times more oil imports out of Russia? How do you make the two meet? Well, look... Uh First of all, I don't, honestly, uh, I don't see a non-alignment oil uh, connection at all. I mean, today Europe is buying oil. Europe is buying gas. Uh, I just read the new lot of, the new package uh, of sanctions. Now, the package is designed in a way in which consideration has been given to the welfare of the population. So, you know, uh, pipelines have a certain carve out. Uh, so, and timelines have been given. It's not like tomorrow morning everything is going to be cut off. So, I, people need to understand, if you can be considerate of yourself, surely you can be considerate of other people. So, if a Europe says, uh, look, uh, we have to manage it in a way in which its impact on my economy is not traumatic, uh, uh, that that uh, freedom or that choice should exist for other people as well. Now, in terms of uh, our oil purchases, we don't send people out there saying, go buy Russian oil. We send people out there saying, go buy oil. Now, you buy the best oil you can in the market. Uh, so I, I, I don't think uh, uh, I would attach a political uh, messaging uh, to that. Uh, I would also... How, how do you not conflate the two? I mean, it, 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 I know the Indian-Russian relationship is strong, but you also have issues with China. How do you then sit back and define Indian foreign policy at this point where the West seems to be quite vociferous in trying to curtail funding for the war in Ukraine, whereas by purchasing this oil uh, for national interest... <coughs> Um, India is being asked, are you funding this war? So, look, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to sound argumentative, but then tell me buying Russian gas is not funding the war? I mean, why is it, it's only Indian money and uh, oil coming to India which funds, but it's not gas coming to Europe which funds? I mean, look, somewhere, I mean, let's, let's be a little even-handed out here. And even this, you know, look, the whole narrative that it's gone up nine times. I mean, it's gone up nine times from a very low base. And it was a very low base because at that time the markets were more open. You know, why, why if, if uh, countries in Europe and the West and the United States are so concerned, why don't they allow Iranian oil to come into the market? Why don't they allow Venezuelan oil to come into the market? I mean, they've squeezed every other source of oil we have. And then say, okay, guys, you must not go into the market and guess the best deal for your people. I don't think that's a very fair approach. So talk to us about the second aspect that, you, that Indian foreign policy is being questioned at this point uh, when it comes to um, wheat bans and, and food bans uh, mm -hmm. of exports. Um, how does that then correlate? Because we're talking about the global south and the east that is being squeezed by Russia's issues with allowing Ukrainian grains to be exported. Um, but by India doing the same, again, aren't those weakest people in the world being subjected to the same kind of issues from India? Do you see that as supporting Russia? Or is it a completely different element that we don't understand in the West that your perspective is different? Uh, I think answer is B. You don't understand in the West. Uh, but uh, it, it isn't just the West, okay? I don't think people understand because they're not actually tracking the trade. Um, we, have, we have been exporting wheat, okay? Uh, typically, we export about two to three million tons. Last year, last financial year was a better year. Uh, we exported about seven million tons. Uh, this year, before the heat wave uh, hit us very badly, uh, the expectation was that we would do substantial exports, and we were open. I mean, in fact, Prime Minister himself had said on various occasions, saying, look, uh, we see that there's a food crisis in the world, and we'd like to be of help. But what we then saw was a kind of run on our wheat, uh, a large part of it done by 
international traders uh, based out of Singapore and uh, I think to some degree maybe Dubai. Uh, and uh, the result was actually the low income countries who many of whom were our traditional buyers, like our neighbors, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, these are our traditional buyers, okay? Interestingly, the Gulf buys regularly from us. I heard Dr. Tedros in the earlier session talk about Yemen. Yemen buys from us. Sudan buys from us, okay? Now, what we saw was the low-income buyers were being squeezed out. The wheat was going, was actually being stocked for being traded. So, in a way, our goodwill was being used for speculation. Mm -hmm. So, we had to do something to, to stop that. Uh, because it was also impacting us at home. Our prices were going up. So I want to be very clear what we have done. We have actually said, look, we're not going to give speculators an open access to the Indian market so that the Indian customer and the, uh, the LDCs of the world mm. get the short end of that. Yeah. What we are still open to doing uh, is we are where we see a, a kind of a deserving country uh, wanting wheat, very glad to supply it within the realm of possibility. And just for the record, uh, I think we've done this year wheat exports to about 23 countries. The rate of export this year, if I were to take the same period uh, as uh, last year, my rough sense is it's about 4x. Okay. So, so actually uh, it's gone up. And I, I know in many cases, you know, foreign ministers of some countries have called me up and we have assured them that they would have uh, access to our market. So this is all about stopping and curtailing speculation at the end That's of the right. day. That's um, right. And, and preventing a diversion uh, to high income countries with a greater possibility to buy because what we saw happen with the vaccines, yeah. you know, we don't want to see happen with the wheat, which was the rich people got vaccinated and the poor were left to God and... Well, that brings what up about? a question again from the audience now, and I would like to ask, uh, I, I will come to you. I want to just do one question from um, uh, the online audience, which kind of follows up on your point of diversions. Um, uh, this person's asking, according to the Wall Street Journal, India is becoming a key point for transshipment of Russian oil to bypass uh, sanctions. How does that serve India's foreign policy interests? <laughs> I don't know. Does whoever wrote that knows what transshipment means? Well, I mean, transshipment is when you get the rest it. Of us. No, when you get it and you sell it to somebody else. I I have not even heard of uh, anybody in India uh, thinking along those lines. So yes, we do buy. So Russia. you're saying the Wall Street Journal report is inaccurate that they're quoting? Uh, uh, politely, yes. Okay. So I can India, say it less India politely, is but I'm not I, a, a conduit to any Russian oil transactions. No, not. A, I mean, listen, please understand the oil markets. There's an enormous shortage of oil. There's a physical shortage of oil. Getting access to oil is difficult. I mean, a country like India would be crazy to get oil from somebody and sell it to somebody else. I mean, this is nonsense. So that is your question answered and the ministers on the record. Yes, please. If you could stand up, give us your name. And a brief question. Konstantin <coughs> Eggert, <coughs> freelance journalist from Vilnius, Lithuania. Uh, Dr. Jashankar, um, with um, the Indian government essentially ignoring uh, war crimes in Ukraine, not condemning Russia, mm, not doing sanctions, um, question. you then expect, I'm totally sorry, I know what I do, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with India counting on global support for uh, in its struggle with China, its issues with China. Um, how do you think you'll be trusted by others after that? Why do you think anyone will help Delhi after you didn't help others over Ukraine? Thank you. You know, it's an interesting question which you might, I mean, not you meaning you personally, uh, but uh, people might want to ask themselves because if I were to take Europe collectively, which has been singularly silent on many things which were happening, for example, in Asia, you could ask why would anybody in Asia trust Europe on anything at all? Uh, so here's the take. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, I mean, first of all, I think you're mischaracterizing our position uh, where, we've, where they have, for example, when Bucha happened, we condemned Bucha. And we actually asked for an investigation 
uh, into Bucha. Uh, in terms of what is happening with the Ukraine conflict, our position is very clearly that we favor uh, uh, an immediate cessation of hostilities. It's not that we've ignored it, unless you call phone calls to Putin and Zelensky as ignoring something. Uh, so first, I would urge you to get the factual position accurately. Uh, secondly, in terms of the connection you are making, look, uh, you know, we, we have a difficult relationship with China. We're perfectly capable of managing it. It's, uh, if, if uh, I get global uh, understanding and support, obviously it is of help to me. But this idea that I do a transaction that I come in in one conflict because it will help me in conflict too. That's not how the world works. Uh, so th a lot of our problems in China have nothing to do with Ukraine, have nothing to do with Russia. They predate it. And there are, I mean, if we are getting into who is silent on what issue at what point of time, I could point to a whole lot of issues on which, as I said, uh, I mean, Europe has uh, sort of uh, uh, held its peace. So. I mean, it's, it's a great uh, polemical point you made, so I take it in that spirit. I think uh, as a follow-up to that, a, a lot of uh, the noises I've been hearing both in the United States and here in Europe is on a similar train that you have a problem with China uh, on the on, in the border. On the border, it's been going on for uh, decades now. It is getting worse. Uh, what position does that leave you in when it comes to seeking support if further incursions are done, further skirmishes happen at the border or within the border to kind of echo what's happening in Ukraine in terms of sovereignty issues that are being raised? Um, so uh, I sorry, do you mind if I interrupt no, you? No, please Look. do. But I want I want to come back to a question. Um, the the crux of the question question, which I asked a few people in, um, uh, in the political circles, in the financial circles, what's your big question? And one of the foremost geopolitical strategists on Wall Street sent me this question for you. Mm -hmm. And the question is simple. If and when the choice comes down to it, not today, not tomorrow, but in the future, and she strongly believes it will, for India, will it become, in terms of support, the US or China? And that will be kind of a defining moment that comes out of the situation that we face with Russia right now. Look, uh, uh, number one, uh, the, you know why I wanted to uh, interrupt you in a way. I mean, I'm, I'm partly reacting to the previous observation. You know, somewhere Europe has to grow out of the mindset that Europe's problems are the world's problems but the world's problems are not Europe's problems. That it's, if it is you, it's yours. If it is me, it's ours. I think that's something, uh, and I see you know, reflections of that. Uh, again, in terms of, you know, you, there is a linkage today which is being made. You know, a linkage between China and India and what's happening in Ukraine. So come on guys, I mean, China and India happened way before anything happened in Ukraine. So the Chinese don't need a precedent somewhere else in the world on how to you know, engage us or not engage us or be difficult with us or not be difficult with us. So I, I, as I said, I mean, I just see this as frankly a not very clever argument, a very self-serving one. Uh, and uh, uh, this idea that you know, your grand strategy must be about how you will choose. I will do what as all of us do, I will weigh the, the situation, you know, like uh, everybody, after all, what do, uh, how do countries eventually make decisions? They but find, Shankar, there, there will uh, always be two axes at this point. I think it's an, it's an understood, accepted fact that you have the West, US-led, you have China as the next uh, potential axis. Where does India fit into this? But are you no, planning to not the, No, I'm sorry. That is exactly where I disagree with you. This is, this is the construct you are trying to impose on me. And I don't accept it. I mean, I, I don't feel, I don't think it's necessary for me to join this axis or not. And if I'm not joining this, I must be with the other one. I don't accept that. I mean, I think I, I am a, I'm one fifth of the world's population. I am, what today, the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. 
uh, I, I mean, forget the history civilization bit, everybody knows that. But I, I think I'm entitled to have my own side, I'm entitled to weigh my own interests, make my own choices, and my choices will, uh, will not be cynical and transactional, but they will be a balance of my values and my interests. There is no country in the world which disregards its interests. So, as a final question, because I know you have to go, and uh, we, our time has been cut short. And the, and the by coffee your staff. break is coming. And yes. the coffee break is less important, yeah. but your yeah. staff is insisting you have meetings. As a final question, then, to leave us with this perspective, as you say, there is a whole part of the world that we are ignoring and the perspectives that we are ignoring. What will or what is India's position on the world stage? Because if you want to talk about one-fifth of, of the world's population, you cannot also sit on the fence when it comes to foreign policy matters. Uh, Non-alignment isn't plausible if you want to take your position on the world stage. What does it look like with three years of your government left, approximately? Um, and what does of it this term. Of oh, two years, actually. Oh, two years. Yes. Uh, let, thank you for the correction. Yes. Or yes. I, even in the next decade or so. What is India's position? Sitting on the fence is not an option to be a world leader. I, look, I don't think we're sitting on the fence just because I don't agree with you uh, doesn't make me sitting on the fence. It means I'm sitting on my ground. And my ground is actually, uh, you know, if, what are the big challenges of the world, okay? Big challenges of the world are climate change. I think I'm very critical to the solution. I can be an exemplar. I can be actually an arena for an enormous leapfrogging of green technologies. Look at terrorism. Look at the emergence of a world order. Uh, look at security. Uh, look at sustainable development goals. I mean, you take any and all of the big challenges of the world, some part of the answer either comes out of India, can be contributed to India. And again, I, I, I hate to say, you know, come, it's a bit like a broken record, but look, a lot of things are happening outside uh, Europe. Uh, uh, we have, partly because of climate change, for a lot of humanitarian, natural disasters, humanitarian responses. In our part of the world today, uh, a lot of people look to us to help out. The days when they expected Europe to come, which Europe did at the 2004 tsunami. The difference today is nobody's even thinking of that anymore. So. The world is changing, new players are coming, new capabilities are coming, but a new agenda must come. The world cannot be that Eurocentric as it used to be in the past. And who will India play with? Will it be Europe and the US, or will it be China and Russia? No, look, they're not, they not exclusionary, but we are a democracy, we are a market economy, we are a pluralistic society, we have laws and contracts, we uh, have positions on international law. Uh, so I think that should give you a fair part of the answer. After all, you began the question with a reference to the Quad. Uh, I mean, even though we didn't get much time to talk about it, but the fact that you have uh, uh, today a grouping like the Quad, uh, we just had its uh, summit in Tokyo, where very important decisions were made on connectivity, on telecommunications, on supply chains, on cyber security, uh, on, in fact, uh, on maritime domain awareness. Uh, it should tell you something which direction we're going. So again, I urge you that don't use necessarily a, a caricature version of one situation as a yardstick to pass a sweeping judgment. Because even on Ukraine, do, do reflect on this point. Somewhere at some point, surely the conflict has to end. Somebody will have to, you know, a set of people, it, it cannot be a single country, probably not, mm -hmm. will have to engage the players. It is our collective interest to find some kind of resolution, unless you're throwing up your hands and say this is not fixable. So at that point, I, I think people will need us. It says a diplomat, uh, a career diplomat turned politician, then diplomacy and keep going with it. Thank you very much, Minister, for joining us. And thank you all for being part of this conversation. Please give him a round of applause. Okay. We're taking a quick break now for coffee. I think it's been cut short to about 10 minutes. So grab your coffees, get a caffeine hit, and we'll see you right back here. Thank you. We go back to the same bit.